Welcome to Undiscarded Stories of New York, a podcast brought to you by the City Reliquary Museum and Civic Organization in Brooklyn. My guest today is Gabriel Willow, a naturalist and environmental educator, well known for his appearances on NPR and the classes and tours he gives on the birds of New York City. I grew up in rural Maine, so I spent a lot of time running around in the woods, but my family's from Brooklyn, so I'd always come to Brooklyn to visit my grandparents and cousins and stuff. So I had this sort of country mouse, city mouse sort of duality, you know? And I always loved it in Brooklyn and wanted to live here, so I moved here after college. And I studied ecology and environmental education and conservation biology, and I wasn't sure if I would pursue that sort of thing in New York. But then it turns out people in the city, I think, maybe people everywhere, but maybe more so in the city actually, really seem to want to connect with nature. And so I started leading like urban nature tours and doing environmental education with kids. And it really took off. And I've been doing that now for 20 years. Gabriel is joining me today to look at one of the many things hanging in the front windows of the city reliquary facing Metropolitan Ave in Williamsburg. This is a small rectangular wooden picture frame, around 12 by 10 inches, filled with chicken wire. Then hanging from the wire are four little groups of thick plastic rings, obviously very well worn with use. They each have a code of letters and numbers inscribed on them. We have some black tags. We have something that looks like yellow and very muddy. It's got some numbers. It's got NYC etched on it. So why don't you tell me what we're looking at here? Okay, well, they are a form of tag, although in the U.S. these are usually called bands. In Europe, in England, they tend to call them rings. They're circular, and they have a little split in them to allow for expansion. So you would take these, and they would come apart in the middle like that, see? And they have, yeah, they have a unique number and letter combination. I guess they're kind of like a license plate in a way. And they say New York, like like some license plates. So so these are basically license plates for pigeons. Oh, wow. Pigeons. <laughs> yeah. Why would pigeon need tags? <laughs> well, people banned birds for different reasons. So there's scientists who ban wild birds. I've done this myself. Those are usually, um, sometimes they're plastic and colored like this. They're often aluminum. And those are so that if anybody recaptures that bird, they can figure out where it was banded. So you might band a bird maybe when it's young on its breeding grounds, maybe up in Canada, but then it's recaptured down in South America or something. So it tells you something about its movements, longevity. Nowadays, we have more sophisticated things where you can have GPS, you know, technology that's sort of superseding some of this, but this is pretty old school. So whereas with pigeons, you know, these would be domestic pigeons, not, not the street pigeons. It's so that people who keep pigeons can identify their birds, just like someone might brand a cow so they know which is their herd. So I believe, and you know more about this than me, there's a rather rich history of pigeon keeping in New York City. And especially, I mean, I think it goes way back. All the New York City pigeons, or really all the pigeons you find in most places in the world, are feral and, and sometimes when you hear that word feral, it makes you think of something like wild and ferocious, like a feral animal. What it actually means, it does come from that similar root, like feros, wild, ferocious is a related word. But it, it really means technically something that was domestic that went wild. With pigeons, they're a bird that now just nests on buildings and they're out doing their own thing. And sometimes people feed them bread in a park or whatever, but they're functionally a wild animal, but they are all descended from domestic pigeons. And they used to be really important for food, meat, eggs, sending messages. You know, before the telegram, a pigeon was the fastest way to get a message somewhere. So they served a lot of different purposes for humans and they were a pretty common domestic animal. There was different types of pigeons. There were categories called fancy pigeons, which were ones that just looked really fancy. Some of them Wow, had, I'm trying to picture one. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. You don't think of pigeons as they, yeah, they seem a little mundane. A lot of the fancy breeds emerged in the Victorian era when they were really into these curios and strange looking things. 
Some of them had ruffs around their necks. Some of them had long feathers on their legs. Their legs looked almost like wings, sort of these long angelic kind of feathers. There were ones called tumblers that when they're flying in the air, they would do somersaults. There were puffers that would sort of puff up their chest. I mean, all pigeons do that to some extent, but these would do it to an exaggerated degree. There's some that would fan their tails and hold them upright like a peacock. So there's all these fancy pigeons that had a lot of different, like were selected for wild feathering and stuff. Darwin was super obsessed with pigeons. He opened on The Origin of Species, the first chapters about pigeons. Oh, wow, I didn't um, know that. <laughs> yeah, to talk about selection and diversity and how it's sort of a metaphor about evolution. Although they're a domestic animal and we selected for that diversity, it was sort of pointing out how diversity can happen within a species fairly quickly. So there are definitely a bunch of famous New Yorkers who are, you know, into pigeons. I think Bert from Sesame Street. Oh, yeah, classic. <laughs> yeah, he's even got the pigeon dance. He's a classic. Yeah. And then actually Nikola Tesla was apparently really into pigeons and he would frequent New York City parks searching for injured birds and he would bring them back to his residence and, you know, apparently nurse them back to health. And, wow. health, and he documented this in a novel. I know famously... Also that Mike Tyson had pigeons when he was young, um, sort of his origin story. He lived in East New York, I believe, or Brownsville, somewhere in Brooklyn. He was actually small for his age and he had a lisp and he was picked on. And there was some bully supposedly who killed one of his pigeons. And it was kind of his like superhero or villain, depending on how you look at it, origin story where he wanted to learn to fight to defend himself and his birds. So yeah, they, they've definitely inspired people in a lot of ways for a long time. But many if not most of the people in New York City who have kept pigeons through the years have done so for a particular reason. That reason is to practice a sport that is seen as a quintessential pastime of old New York, pigeon racing. But at some point, people also just, they started racing them. People are naturally a little competitive, and so it would be like they started breeding for power and speed. And then people would bet on them. It just became a, a thing, just like people race dogs or whatever. So you had these high-speed racing pigeons that were specialized, sort of the greyhounds of pigeons, right? In pigeon racing, the owners of these specially bred racing pigeons spend months or even years training them to use their natural homing abilities to return to their own coops. Then, for the race itself, a group of trainers will bring their best birds to a location that's been carefully mapped from each of the competitors' coops. The birds are released, and their return home is timed. The ones who covered the distance at the highest average rate of speed win. This was a tremendously popular pastime in New York in years past. I mean, this, this has been going on for a very long time. So in New York City, yeah, they were brought over probably with the first European colonists, mostly for food, but you may have had some racing pigeons too, who knows. And then more recently with different waves of immigrants, you folks bringing their prized racing pigeons, and then they would keep them on their rooftops and fly them around. I've definitely heard about the number of coops they used to be, especially during the 1940s and 50s that, you know, people's roofs used to have these big coops. And of course, now with all the gentrification and constructions, yep. Yep. The, the roof is more for lounge furniture. I mean, even with, I mean, you talk about it, it definitely was bigger in the 40s and 50s. But I remember in the 90s and the early aughts, seeing especially certain neighborhoods, Bushwick, I used to see this a lot, parts of Williamsburg, more over in like the, what used to be a more predominantly Italian part of like near Lorimer and stuff. I used to always see pigeons, these tight circles, you'd see them circling rooftops. Pigeons instinctually circle up when they see a predator. So you'll still see feral pigeons doing that. If they see a hawk or a falcon, you'll see them sort of form this ball in the air and circle around. It's like a school of fish tightening up to confuse a predator. A little intimidating as well for- Yeah, and it's harder for a predator to single out a single bird. Um, but the people who'd keep pigeons in what's called a pigeon coat, which is this sort of cage or, or coop on the roof, they would usually have a flag and they would stand on the roof and wave the flag and they would train the pigeons to circle when they would wave that flag. So they're building on an instinctual behavior the pigeons have in response to a predator, but they train the pigeons to do this. So this is something I used to see regularly. And I, I have to say, I haven't seen it in, in years. I'm sure there's still people out there keeping pigeons, but as you say, like there's more and more rules. Neighbors might complain, oh, they're dirty, whatever, whatever. Sometimes landlords, if you're lucky, you have like a lounge space on your roof. But a lot of times, like my roof in the apartment I live in, I used to be able to go on the roof, but then they put an alarm on the door. I guess they're worried about liability or I don't know. It's a bummer. So a lot of places you just can't go on the roof at all. And certainly landlords, 
if unless you own your own place with roof access, a landlord's not going to necessarily be very amenable, I imagine, to having a whole flock of pigeons living on their roof. So yeah, it seems like it's becoming a much rarer pastime than it used to be. How um, many pigeons are there in New York? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know. I wonder. I wonder. I mean, it's got to be in the in the millions, but I imagine they they don't outnumber humans quite yet. That's a really good question, though. So I'm curious to know your point of view. Are pigeons a nuisance? Are they flying rats? Uh, or are they, yeah, like you what, said, uh, what what's it called? Pigeon fanciers right, crave? Right. <laughs> yeah, well, Woody Allen called them flying rats or rats with wings, I think he called them. I, they're certainly not on par with rats. They might be in certain ways in the way that they live alongside humans in cities, the way they reproduce pretty pretty quickly, although not the way the rats do. But unlike rats, they're not a serious disease vector and they don't cause that much damage. Rats chew and they'll chew holes in things. They'll chew wires. They cause millions of dollars of damage to infrastructure and buildings every year. Pigeons poop on things and that's about it. People don't love that, but it doesn't usually actually damage that many things. And they don't really spread disease, which a lot of people think they do. I even see signs in some city parks, like in Bryant Park, there's signs that say, please don't feed the pigeons. They spread disease. That's actually not true. There just aren't that many zoonotic diseases that we get from wild birds. But anyway, it's, they're not a major, so they're not really a pest truly in the way that a rat or a bed bug or something would be some other species that live in urban spaces. I like them myself. I've even been known to adopt the occasional injured pigeon myself, not in a while, but I have done that before. Yeah, I mean, I think their variability is part of what's fascinating about them because a lot of other animals, like you can identify the species, like, oh, that's a robin, that's a chickadee, you know, whatever, but you probably can't tell one from the other. But pigeons really are so variable that you can get to know individual pigeons. And if you start to pay attention, you know, they have home ranges that are, they can fly quite far if they want to. They're very powerful flyers, actually. It's funny because when they're walking around, they look so kind of waddly and rotund and ungainly. But as that's also how they're depicted a lot like yeah. in pictures. <laughs> yeah. But as flying birds, they're super fast. They're one of the fastest birds. They can fly 45 or 50 miles an hour, which is why they're good at carrying messages and stuff. Yeah, they're very powerful flyers, incredible homing abilities. And so often when I'm leading bird tours, I'll, we'll, there'll be one flying high overhead and I'll point out to a group and I'll be like, look at that, what is that? Look how fast, how sleek, what could that be? And people are like, it's a falcon, It's a, which is a good guess because it's another sleek, fast bird. They throw out all these different guesses and I'm like, no, it's a pigeon. And they're like, what? Because yeah, if you just look up and see one flying high overhead, they have a really different aspect. But anyway, in spite of the fact they can fly very far, they often stick to a fairly small home range. They mate for life, so they tend to stay near their mate, you know, unless their mate dies or something, then they'll find a new mate. So if you start paying attention to your local flock, you could get to know individual pigeons, and that's kind of neat because they do come in so many different colors. And that is because they're a feral animal. Like humans had selected different pigeons to be different colors, just like with dogs. There's different breeds. Some are even within a single breed, like a Labrador Retriever can be black or chocolate or yellow. So that process happened with pigeons. And so you'll see some that are reddish or reddish brown, some that are kind of chocolate brown, some that are black, some that have checkers or spots, some that are white pied, which means patchy, white in colors. So it's, yeah, so they, they're pretty, dis the individuals can be quite distinctive, which I think is neat. Have like other variations of pigeons evolved just in New York from being in like, I mean, you know, I'm a little curious about like the evolution mm -hmm. of this bird within like an urban, because I know that's an area you you know a lot about. That's a great question. I mean, like if you were to measure the pigeons in New York and then the pigeons that are in, in the square in Rome, are, are the pigeons in New York typically heavier or longer beaked or longer winged? Probably not. These pigeons have only been here probably since the 1600s. I mean, that's a while, but we're looking at less than 400 years. And so from an evolutionary standpoint, that's probably not long enough. They're, they're still the same species. They're still pretty similar. If, if you came back in a few thousand years and checked, you might find some differences. But there is, uh, there is a wild type pigeon. I mean, there is still the wild pigeons that are in Central Asia where they originated. The official name of the species is the rock pigeon because they nest on cliffs often in fairly arid regions. And there's some that nest on coastal cliffs, I think in Spain and Western France. And I've seen some in Western Europe and I don't know whether they're officially the wild ones or not. I'd love someday to go to, I don't know, Kazakhstan or somewhere and find these, you know, they're, they're very shy actually. But anyway, among the feral ones, there's birds that look like the original pigeons and those are called blue bar pigeons. They're blue gray, they have a white patch at the base of their tail on their lower back. They have two bars on the wings. And so that's a 
sort of distinct type, as opposed to a wood pigeon, say, which is another European pigeon that's bigger, that nests in trees. So there you have these different wild pigeons. And of course, here in New York, we used to have our own wild native pigeon that's extinct, the passenger pigeon. Really? Yeah. It looked more like a giant mourning dove. It had a long pointed tail, sort of rusty brown, very pretty bird. And that was the most abundant bird that ever existed. There were billions, four to five billion, I think. John James Audubon, the great bird painter and naturalist, wrote about flocks of passenger pigeons darkening the skies for days when they were migrating overhead. It, you couldn't see the sun. It would be like an eclipse or a storm wow. <laughs> for like three days straight. How long ago was this? The last one died out in 1913, I believe. There was a pair in the Cincinnati Zoo, George and Martha, named for the Washingtons. And they were the last remaining ones and they were in captivity. And then once Martha died, that was it. Oh, that's really sad. And was there a reason why? Well, basically there was a giant deciduous forest that extended from the coastal plain along the Atlantic all the way to the Mississippi River. And then you started having more of the, the plains going west of that. But they, they, say, they used to say a squirrel could hop from Boston to St. Louis without ever touching the ground. And a lot of these trees had nuts. So you had oak trees with acorns, beech trees with beech nuts, the American chestnut, which is now nearly extinct, which had chestnuts and various others. And the, the passenger pigeons ate what's called mast, nuts and seeds. And so there was just a ton of resources for them. And so it was thought they were just an inexhaustible resource. And they were hunted for food by Native Americans who would light fire to the trees where they were nesting or shoot them with bows and arrows and stuff. But once Europeans came along with firearms, it kind of changed the picture. So people would just hunt them and hunt them. And then once the railroads went in, they would pack them in barrels and ship them on railroads. They were a major source of food that was fed to slaves. So pigeons were shipped to the South to plantations and stuff where they were fed to slaves because there was just, it was cheap and a lot of meat. And it's also thought they were just so used to being in big flocks, they nested colonially in huge flocks and that once their numbers got below a certain level, maybe they just couldn't, like behaviorally, they just didn't know how to go on. But sure enough, we were able to reduce their population to the point where they went extinct. So that's kind of a sad story, but that was our native wild pigeon. It's this interesting contrast, right, of birds that really can't handle certainly like that level of persecution, but also just don't necessarily want to be around human settlement. I mean, maybe given enough time, pigeon, the passenger pigeon could have adapted, but also there's certain animals that just need large expanses of unbroken forest or unaltered prairie or something like that, and they're going to suffer. And then you have species like the rock pigeon, AKA the city pigeon that flourish in these settings. And it's, you know, it's even within the same family. It's kind of interesting. Why is that? Why are they flourishing in this otherwise, what would you would consider not a very natural, hospitable environment? When you think of New York, you think of these like crowded yeah. streets, cars and skyscrapers and tons of people. Well, again, they're originally not from what we would consider a very hospitable environment. They're from deserts, cliffs, places that are harsh, hot, dry, can get, also get very cold. If you look somewhere like Kazakhstan or, or Pakistan or some places that there's real extremes of heat and cold. So they're already a, a pretty hardy bird to begin with. And maybe that's why the rock pigeon was well poised to become so successful. And then it didn't hurt that it was, it was domesticated. And so it was sort of bred selected to be comfortable around people as are most domestic animals. You look at wolves and they're another animal that, that needs big tracts of forest, tends to be pretty shy around people and is also directly persecuted, shot, hunted everywhere. But then the dog, you know, is a domestic descendant of the wolf, super successful animal that's found everywhere. So the, the pigeon is more what's called a commensal species. And that's a type of symbiosis. Commensa means to share a table. And that's a one animal that lives off the kind of crumbs of another, but it's not deleterious to that, to that other animal. So like that would be a parasite, something, a parasitic relationship is one where one is feeding off the other, living off the other, but is harmful to it. And then you have mutualism where it's mutually beneficial. That's what people think of when they think of symbiosis. But commensalism is kind of funny. It's where one party is indifferent and the other party benefits. And that's really where it is with pigeons. I mean, some people don't like them, but functionally they don't affect us negatively, but they really thrive around us. They're also getting 
bread products and there's food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're a cliff dweller originally. And so they did really well in cities once the skyscraper was invented because skyscrapers are basically man-made cliffs, especially the older type that's made of brick or stone, has ledges. A pigeon wouldn't be nesting on a curtain glass smooth skyscraper. Yeah, but the ones with the little gargoyles and the little, you know. (laughs) They're in those nooks and crannies and you'll often hear... Young pigeons are called squeakers and they, they squeak. They're often up under s- store awnings, although they'll put those pigeon spikes and stuff up in there, but they'll nest right on top of the pigeon spikes on top of air conditioning units. To them, it's all, it's a cliff. So yeah, so the cities work out very well for them. It's become the New York City mascot, whether mm-hmm. people want it or not. I think they've been embracing it in recent years. There's a lot of yeah. memorabilia. Your shirt has pigeons on it right, right. there. <laughs> what are some other type of animals that are thriving in New York City? Oh, so Outside many. of uh, cockroaches right, and all I was that say, other you stuff. Can't forget yeah. cockroaches, don't leave them out. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a couple other non-native species that humans brought here, that Europeans brought here. The European starling is another bird species, and then the house sparrow. House sparrow is another ubiquitous urban bird like the pigeon. They don't seem to get the, like some people really just don't like pigeons, you know, and talk about them pooping on everything. And the house sparrow doesn't, everybody seems to be okay with them. Sometimes they're a little annoying if they come hopping up when you're eating lunch or something and they kind of look at you like they want to bite of your sandwich. But something I think is neat is if you look around and you start paying attention, most of the stoplights in New York have a specific design where there's this long sort of boom arm holding the stoplight out over an intersection. And there's a cross piece holding a strut. And the cross piece is a hollow metal tube. And the house sparrows think it's a perfect birdhouse. So if you look at these, this cross piece, this hollow metal tube that's holding up the struts that hold up the stoplight, every single one, every single intersection has a house sparrow nest in it. And you'll see a little bit of grass sticking out at the end. They make their nests out of grass. And often you'll see the sparrows peeking out of that tube. And I just, it cracks me up because it's like not the intent of that architecture at all. But the sparrows are like, oh, cool. Yeah, you're making nesting sites for me, obviously, at every every intersection. And so I just think that's really ingenious, that adaptability that they show. And then in terms of native species, like I said, a lot are returning to urban spaces. The red-tailed hawk, Red-tailed hawks now nest all over the city. There's a pair over on a big floodlights on a ball field over in McCarran Park here in Williamsburg. But we didn't have red-tailed hawks nesting in New York City until the 1990s. So it's a relatively recent phenomenon. And now they're, they're doing great. Bald eagles. People don't, ex- don't imagine that you could see a bald eagle in New York City, but I see bald eagles here all the time. There was one last winter hanging out in Central Park on the reservoir eating The ducks. owls always. Owls, uh, yeah. Yellow. And people go crazy for them. Yeah. Great horned owls, eastern screech owls. Eastern screech owls nest in, in Wood Hill Park in Manhattan, in, on Staten Island in the Bronx. So, yeah, there's probably five or six species of owls. There was a snowy owl in Central Park a couple winters ago. Seals. There's seals in New York Harbor every winter. They swim, they migrate down from the Gulf of Maine where they breed. You can see hundreds of seals out on Swinburne and Hoffman Island near the Verrazano Bridge. Whales making a huge comeback in our region. I was once leading a boat tour for City of Water Day down the Hudson on the Circle Line, and a humpback whale came up next to the boat. It was amazing. You you saw its exhalation of the of the breath, what they call the spout. It's not really a spout; it's just water vapor. But and there's whale watching trips out of Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. They see humpbacks pretty much every time they go out. So yeah, coyotes. Coyotes have made a real comeback. There's coyotes in Central Park. I've seen coyotes in the Bronx. So there's all kinds of wildlife around in the city. So back to this, this artifact, these tags. Why do you think something like this belongs in a museum, in a museum like the reliquary? Well, the reliquary specifically is this, all this arcana of New York City, arcana ephemera, right? And Pigeons, like you said, although they're not native to this continent, this species of pigeon, they're really identified with New York City. I mean, I think New Yorkers pride ourselves on being a little tenacious, a little tough, you know, and the pigeon reflects some of those qualities, as does the the rat. So I think we don't, a lot of people don't like them, but also kind of begrudgingly respect them. So in terms of why this would belong in the reliquary, I think it reflects something about New Yorkers. It reflects something about history. It's also, there's an element where we're losing some of that history. You know, the pigeons are doing fine. There's plenty of pigeons around the city, but but the pigeon fanciers, the people who used to keep the pigeons on their roofs, they're kind of a dying breed. Those folks are getting displaced. They're getting priced out. 
Um, some of it might just be generational. I don't know if young people are interested in keeping pigeons as much, but even if they were, it's harder to do so. Hopefully the pigeon fanciers won't go the way of the passenger pigeon, you know? So yeah, I think it's a perfect thing to have in the window here. This has been Undiscarded, Stories of New York, a podcast brought to you by the City Reliquary Museum and Civic Organization in Brooklyn, New York, in partnership with Citizen Racecar. My name is Tanya Muhammad, and I produce this show in collaboration with David Hoffman, who edits the stories. Post-production and original music by Jose Miguel Baez. Contributing producer, Jacob Ford. Production manager, Gabriela Montequin. Outreach manager, Sarah Shalantano. And a special thanks to Dave Herman. To learn more about these artifacts, check out undiscarded.org. And be sure to follow at City Reliquary on Instagram for facts and pictures. Head to cityreliquary.org to hear all about the museum's mission, exhibits, and events. If you enjoyed this episode of Undiscarded, please don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, leave us a review, and help spread the word. There are so many more stories to tell. Thank you.